This is uh, your own hand at Tiny Mass Games postmortem. Uh, I am Matthew Brailsford. Uh, you can call me Matt. This is my email, Matt at Giant Light Studios. Uh, on Twitter at Giant Light, I'm still on there. I'm not super active. I kind of just post stuff, but I'm not like super. Yeah. Uh, Giant Light Studios is the name of my little company uh, that I release games and do contract work under. Uh, and then Tiny Mass Games is, of course, uh, this thing that I started, and I'll talk a bunch about Tiny Mass Games. Uh, and then this is sort of some of the sort of logo for the, the second Tiny Mass game that I did, which I'll, I'll be talking about a bunch today. Uh, so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Tiny Mass Games and what Tiny Mass Games is and why we make small games and, you know, kind of the history of it, stuff like that. Uh, we're going to talk about the game itself. Uh, again, your own hand. Uh, and then kind of most of the talk is going to be like, okay, well, how did I do it, right? Like, how, how, do, how do I go about making a game really, really quickly? Um, and so we'll talk about sort of the different disciplines and, you know, kind of take them in turn. Uh, and then I'll talk about what works, and then I'll talk a little bit about some challenges, and then I'll talk about kind of what my next steps are uh, for both Tiny Mass Games and for my own work. Okay. So what is Tiny Mass Games? Um, so the goal of Tiny Mass Games is to release a game every three months. Right, it's a big collective of us. There's, I don't know, close to 80 people right now. And every three months we start a new season and our goal is to release uh, separately or on small teams, uh, a new game, right? Uh, and so we've completed two seasons so far. So there, there was the January, February, March season and the April, May, June season. And in both of those seasons, we released six games. So we've now released 12 games total, which is really exciting. Um, several of them have made it up onto Steam. Uh, they've been streamed by people like Retromation, Wanderbots. They've been played, I think, probably hundreds of thousands of times at this point. So we found some success, um, which is really exciting. The kind of cadence that we everyone kind of works a little bit differently uh the idea behind the cadence was that we would work for two months and then we would take a month off and kind of do sort of release stuff marketing stuff uh i did that okay in the first one in the second one i totally took all three months to just make the game um a big sort of key part of how i felt it needed to work to be as inclusive as possible is that there are no financial entanglements whoops so we're not like an LLC. We don't do any rev share. We're not, you know, it's all just, we all get together. We release games under our own name, however we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. Uh, so there's no financial entanglement. Uh, that's really important um, to keep things open. We have weekly and monthly meetings. So we meet Tuesdays at noon and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Uh, and we kind of just like show what we're working on. We have a rotating sort of, you get to be the speaker if you want type thing. Uh, and then the first Wednesday of every month, we kind of have our bigger meeting. Oh, I trailed off here. Uh, first Wednesday of every month um, on our Discord, we have our, our bigger sort of monthly meeting where we all get together. We're mostly active on our Discord, uh, which if you message me, I, you know, I'm happy to invite you. Uh, and we are super flexible that none of the above are set in stone. Some people uh, started a game before Tiny Mass Games even existed and released it as part of Tiny Mass Games. Lots of people start a game, don't finish it. Lots of people start a game, maybe plan to take six months. Uh, some people do release on Itch, some people release on Steam, some people don't release. Um, so it's kind of totally up to you what you want to make of it. Uh, and anyone can participate. Uh, just don't be a jerk. Uh, and so far, everyone's really, really lovely and, and supportive. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of what Tiny Mass Games is. Uh, why uh, does Tiny Mass Games exist? Uh, well, uh, spending four years on a game is just grueling. I've done it a couple of times and it's so hard. Uh, it's just really hard. Um, but that's kind of, you know, four years is just an arbitrary number. Sometimes games, even even two years, right? Two years to make a game is really, really hard. It, and, um, and I've got a lot more ideas that I want to get out of me. Um, so yeah, so it's just hard to do the sort of typical thing. And I, I kind of wanted to do this shorter thing, which is also really hard, but in a different way. Um, 
so that's that's reason number one. Reason number two, releasing games is a great way to build a following. So I'm a relatively unknown developer at this stage in my career. You know, I've, I've done sort of a lot of work for a lot of people, but I'm trying now to sort of build a name for myself. Um, and so releasing games so far has proven to be a really good way to build a following. Um, so hopefully, you know, if I do this enough times, then when I go to release that next big commercial thing that I'm doing, um, then maybe I'll have a better shot. Uh, and then I, I just have a personal interest in experimental games, uh, which are easier to sort of justify if it's just like a short little thing. Uh, I'm interested in solo development um, for many reasons. Uh, and one, you know, kind of one of those reasons is I really like doing all of the things. So I really like doing programming. I really like doing the design. I really like doing the art and I really like doing the audio. Um, there's a lot of people in our group who don't do everything, uh, but I, I happen to like doing all those things. Uh, and I think that that makes me sort of uniquely qualified to work on small games um, and to work really quickly, right? I can be really, really lean if I'm just the only person on the project. There's almost no overhead, right? Uh, and then there's this great talk uh, by f former Bostonian, right? I, I, I don't think he's here anymore, uh, but Darius Kazimi uh, gave this talk about how I won the lottery. Uh, and his, his, it's a very tongue-in-cheek talk. Uh, he gives a whole talk about like how he built up a community and how he played certain numbers and you know with the right mindset you too can win the lottery and it's his whole thing is kind of like anyone who's doing creative work um really it's just kind of a crapshoot and what you really want to do is just um just buy a lot of lottery tickets that's the only way to win the lottery is just buy a ton the only way to increase your chances of winning the lottery is to just buy as many lottery tickets as you can and so i i kind of believe that like making lots of small games is a little bit like buying lots of lottery tickets um and then finally there's uh this group called the Sock pop collective who were you know i've been following them for years and they uh they finally kind of had a hit and you know they're just sort of an inspiration for this model of making a lot of small games. Uh, and then just really quickly, uh, some Tiny Mouse Games history. So I used to work for this company called Fable Vision Studios. Uh, I made a lot of games very quickly. Uh, that was just, you know, our clients kind of wanted smaller things and I got in often I was the only programmer. You know, I would usually work with an artist and usually an animator and a producer and stuff, you know, so it was, a little bit more of a traditional team, but still very quick. And so I got really good at making things quickly. Uh, around 2017, uh, there was this guy, Adam Vision, um, and he gave this interview about making a lot of games for and releasing them for $2, which at the time kind of nobody was doing. Now it sort of seems like people are doing it. But uh, yeah, it's it was really inspiring, right? Because I, I was like, boy, I'm never gonna be able to make a four year long blockbuster on a team of a hundred people, but I, I bet I could, I bet I could make something and sell it for $2. Um, and then around the same time, there was another talk by Jake Burkett, you were spending too long making your game, uh, which is just kind of another sort of uh, motivating sort of talk for me. Uh, and so with those two things in mind, I made and released a game, Retro Wing Prime. Uh, it took me about three months. I, I, I meant to, for it to take a month, um, but it took three months. Uh, and that, that, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to try this thing out. Uh, and so I did it and I made maybe $300, uh, but I released the thing. Uh, and then 2019 to 2022, and then early 2022, uh, Sock Pop releases Stacklands uh, commercial success. So that's, you know, I was talking about Sock Pop. Um, and so they've been releasing small games for a billion years. And I kind of always knew, I, I, I felt that I knew like they'll eventually find success. And then they did. Um, and for those that don't know, I think they released, or at least at the time, they were releasing a game every two weeks. Uh, and it was like, they would each, there's, there's four of them, they would spend two months uh, and they would sort of stagger their releases uh, so they could release a thing every two weeks, right? So really ambitious. Um, and they did it. Uh, and that happened and it kicked off a bunch of conversations in, in the Boston and 
uh, PVGD. If I say PVGD, it's the Pioneer Valley Game Developers. It's sort of the Western Mass Game Developer Group. That's I'm I'm out in Western Mass. Used to be in Boston. Um, and it kicked off these really long discussions and kind of got me sort of re-inspired about this small game thing. Uh, and then kind of later that year, Josh Galecki, I don't know if he is here, but he's he's sort of a co-founder or is a co-founder of Tiny House Games. And he was like, hey, uh, why don't, you know, are you going to do that thing? Like, I'm, let's do that thing. I'm going to do that thing. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, yeah, let's do the thing. Uh, and so we, I, you know, we just kind of did it. And uh, now Tiny Mass Games exists. Uh, so that's the history. Uh, this is about me. Uh, I won't spend too, too long here, but so I consider myself like a creative programmer. I'm mostly a programmer, but like I said, I like to do all that other stuff too. Um, I, I happen to like working as a solo developer. I also like very much working on teams, uh, but for the case of Tiny Mass Games, I kind of consider myself a solo-ish developer. Uh, I have a background in educational games, uh, so that's Fable Vision. Um, I also have like a theater background, and the reason that I bring that up is because I think that there's something about working in theater that there's like a real sort of intense deadline kind of mindset, right? Like you can delay a release of a game, you cannot really delay uh, the release of a theater production, right? Like people buy tickets, you're going live whether you're ready or not. I suppose in like severe cases you can play, but like I kind of early on kind of got deadlines are like life or death to me. Um, and so I think that really kind of helps me out. It's not super healthy, uh, but I think kind of helps me out for, for you know, really tight timeline. Uh, and of course, I'm a co-founder of Tiny Mouse Games. Uh, yeah, theater kids. Uh, I was a lighting designer. I was not, I really wanted to be an actor, but I'm, I, I couldn't do it. Um, and then down at the bottom, these are some of the games. So on the left, Betty and Earl, that's the puzzle game I was talking to you about. Uh, in the middle is The Only Tower. That's the first Tiny Mask game game I made, uh, which we're going to look at just like a little bit. Uh, and then on the right is that first uh, Retro Wing Prime game that I made seven years, six years ago now. Um, uh, okay, uh, so, and then this is a little bit about the game itself. Um, so you're not going to be able to hear, oh, um, but uh, let's, let's take a look. Um, sorry, I should have had this link open. Um, but Your Own Hand is an experimental deck-building roguelike strategy game where you are the meta-progression. Um, so yeah, the basic idea uh, is, well, it's, so I really like games that don't tell you anything uh, and it's kind of up to you to understand or, or to figure out like part of the enjoyment of the game is learning how to play the game. Um, I already know how to play this game, uh, but you basically play cards on this hex grid uh, right there, I, I summoned enemies, right? So I was talking earlier, kind of in the pre-show, about uh, you're kind of in control of both the enemies and the, like, the power-ups. Um, but so there, I just, I bring them. I'm going to pick up some gold, put down a candle, uh, and I'm going to talk to the heart. Right, we got some Kate Bush lyrics. Uh, wonderful. So I get some new cards. Uh, okay, so make a deal with god uh so i'll do that i'll get another candle so this is sort of the roguelike element uh i can't afford either of these things but ritual candles are free uh and then i'm going to make a deal with myself uh and this is sort of again that sort of flip side of like i, I picked the the good things but now i'm also picking from the bad things uh, so i'm going to pick a spore just to show it off um and the spore basically grows over time. And the spore I'm going to talk about a little bit later when we look at a different game, because this is the spore itself is like a concept taken from another game, and I'm going to talk about reusing concepts a lot. Uh, so I'm probably going to lose pretty quickly because the spore, I'm not prepared for these spores. Uh, I can stun them with my grab, but um, yeah. Oh, we'll get a boomer. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in big trouble. Uh, so, so that's kind of the game. 
uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on, right? Uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you so you, you got a rough idea of, of what's happening. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's your own hand. We talked about it. Uh, here's some screenshots. This is sort of like the late game, what it can look like. Um, oh, yeah, this this is the K-Push lyrics we, we saw. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So how, okay, so this is most of the talk is how did I do this thing? Um, so I'm also not like, I, I don't like, to, I, I, I feel bad that I put so much text on my slides. I don't usually do that, um, but I don't know. There's a lot that I kind of want to cover. There's a lot that goes into making a game. So yeah. Uh, so I, one of the things, I, I think probably the most important thing more than in other games is is having like a good design or not having good design but having a design that can succeed for a small game for a really small timeline i think that there are certain types of games and certain types of designs that won't lend themselves to being made in three months i don't think you could make a four like a big 4x game you probably couldn't make an mmo um you know i don't want to say definitely attend to those things but like probably right so being really small, like infinitesimally small, and I, I would say like it took me a long time to get good at knowing how small to make a thing. And one of the things I see happen kind of for all level of game developers, right? Like, um, but especially early on, is like you don't really know how small. Like it's kind of shocking how small you need to make a thing uh, if you're going to be successful. And that goes even for sort of like full size games, I think. Um, but especially for a three month cycle, I think having just one mechanic, one mechanic that you're gonna explore and ideally picking something that like is sort of well-worn territory and you're just gonna change like one little piece of it, right? Um, so just really, really, really small. And you can always, and you know, I say down here, onion skin development. Uh, what I mean by that is like starting at the center and like, having something that you could ship like within a week or two weeks right like something that you can be done with really fast and then you just add like layers to it right you can always add more content you can always add a meta game you can always add new characters but like you want to get that like core of it um yeah spiral development might be another name for it uh you know yeah um and yeah, and then this kind of last idea is um, my idea when I started this year is, okay, every game I make this year, all four of them are going to be roguelikes. Uh, and I want to explore this one particular theme about, like, choosing your own, uh, like, hardships, right? And so by doing that, I've been able to already build up sort of a bunch of sort of reusable things, right? So there's, a, like, a ton that I, even though it's a very different type of roguelike, there's a ton that I stole from my first game. Um, so, so kind of designing, uh, and, and I, my first game was like a vampire survivors like, right. Because that's to me, like one of the easiest designs there is no, you know, no shade intended, but, uh, very easy to sort of execute on that. But then kind of my next one, I can be a little bit more ambitious, right. But it's still, because it's using a lot of the same concepts, I could kind of build on my previous game. Uh, and so my second game was a little bit more ambitious, maybe too ambitious, um, but yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so programming. So this is one that I, I kind of, it's hard for me to talk about. Like I think one, because this is sort of the thing that I do the most and I sort of don't really remember what it's like to be um, new to programming. I, I hope that doesn't sound conceited. Uh, but it's just, I, I kind of have forgotten what it's like a little bit. Um, and it's also just, like, I'm not going to show you my code, right? Uh, that would sort of be boring. But uh, I have this quote from my sister. I don't know where she heard it. Um, but if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Uh, I think as programmers, uh, as sort of nerdy engineer types, right? Like we really want to do it right and we want to do it efficiently and we want to be perfect and we want to make the best, most flexible, awesome code base that could ever exist. Um, but like 
that won't fly. Uh, you kind of have to just be brutal and really just full of hacks. Just use singletons for everything. Like, it's fine. If you know Unity, like, use get component. Like, don't do it in an update loop, but, like, call it get component wherever you want. Like, it's fine. Um, and actually, I think that this, this is actually really solid advice for, like, production programming. Uh, I think you have to be wise about it and know when you can do this stuff and when you got to play nicely on your team and, and you know, have robust code or solid code or whatever you want to call it. Um, but for this, just like, it's a game jam. It's effectively a long game jam. So just go for it. It's fine. Just And if it's terrible, you don't need to maintain it. It's going to be done in three months. Just forget about it. Just like, yeah. Uh, so lots of singletons, lots of hacks. Uh, there's this great expression, Yagni, uh, which is you aren't going to need it. So kind of like I was saying, like, don't worry about this big architecture. Don't worry about, you know, like making this flexible ability system that you don't just like hard code everything really. And I know like as a programmer, we're all sort of uh, trained or to like feel like gross about that. So it's a little bit of a hard habit to break. But just, yeah, just go for it. Hard code it uh, and be really specific. Um, and I, I, I really think that this is true for like production programming. I think generalized code is uh, usually bad. I think it's usually a mistake to make, right? It's a form of sort of premature optimization and premature optimization is bad. But generalized code is usually bad. Be really specific. It's so much easier to maintain specific code. It's so much easier to maintain specific code. Uh, generalized code is really hard and inflexible and kind of constrains you uh, in in ways. Uh, be really and that that works great for like web development or business software, but games are really weird and messy and sloppy and organic. Uh, and being really specific lets you kind of be really creative, right? If you have like a generalized system that all of your cards and your deck building roguelike use, well, then if you want to make a really weird card, it's really hard to do that. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, and then I've been building up for years now uh, a library of common utilities. That's really helpful. Um, okay. Um, and and we'll we'll do a round of questions at the end. So if I'm going fast and there's stuff that you want me to cover, uh, just try to remember that, and, and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, okay. All right. So even though uh, I'm, or maybe because I'm a programmer first. I've developed this art style that I think uh, I feel really sort of like strongly about as being um, the way, right? I think if you don't have sort of a lot of quote unquote natural artistic ability, um, like I guess I feel like I didn't, or like I, I think I, I, I'm a good curator, but I'm not like I, I'm not great at drawing. I can't really. I I hate three D modeling, um, right? And so I kind of developed this kind of series of strategies um that i think enable me to make really good looking games you know to pat myself on the back uh without kind of needing some of those like sort of traditional skill sets um and so this is you know i tried to boil it down i gave a talk i gave a gbc talk about this um it's not on it's on the vault if you have vault access but it's not like on youtube maybe i'll give this talk for boston someday but this is sort of like the very boiled down version. So one, use a limited color palette. Um, three colors is maybe even too much. Like this is, so uh, by the way, on the right here is the only tower, which is my first tiny mask game game. And it's just red, it's red, black and white. And that's it for the whole game. Uh, so use a limited color palette, uh, use primitive shapes. So you may not notice, immediately but like literally everything here is either a circle a square or a triangle uh there's also a heart shape so not totally everything but you know like 99.9% .9 of it is a circle a square or a triangle any one of you can go into photoshop and make a circle a square and a triangle and use it in your game to make a beautiful looking game right uh and also shout out to uh, the shapes plugin by freya homer uh, this is all using shapes. Um, so like those dotted edges, uh, that's all sort of in engine. Almost nothing came out of Photoshop or, or anywhere else, right? Um, so yeah, you really, you really only need primitive shapes. Uh, and maybe not for every game, right? So like maybe an MMO, like a, a, a an adventure, big first person adventure wouldn't really work with this strategy i think you could probably get away with just cubes and spheres and 
pyramids and cones. Um, but I haven't proven that to myself yet, so don't quote me on it. But anyway, so limited color palette, primitive shapes. Uh, and then for everything that's not a uh, primitive shape, um, as you'll see in, or as you saw in the demo of the game, uh, I just used the noun project. Uh, so I'll show the noun project actually. Um, so I don't know, um, sort. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden you've got like a million swords. And the, because I've chosen like a really limited color palette, right, I can kind of just get away with using silhouettes. Um, and and it kind of works, right? So so I love um, I love the Nav Project. Uh, and I've started to branch it away from my primitive shapes um, a little bit. Uh, and then another one, because I'm a programmer, but I think other people should kind of get into this. There are tools that would let you do this, but code-driven animation. So none of this is like hand-drawn animation. It's all just like sine waves, really, and then like lerping and then just tweens and stuff like that. Um, so there's a bunch of good reasons to use code-driven animation, uh, but you can just get a ton of juice, right? So again, animation is very time-consuming. Uh, doing code-driven stuff uh, allows me to go a lot faster. Uh, I already talked a little bit about flat shading and silhouette. That goes with sort of the noun project. Um, yeah, and then maybe the most important thing uh, to me is, is post-processing. So one of the hardest things, one of the things I really struggled with for a long time as an early, as a, as a programmer who was working by myself and could not get art for my game, um, is that getting your art to look like it belongs together is like the number one thing. If there's one thing that you could take away from this, it is um, sort of consistency and intentionality, right? If, you're, if, if you demonstrate to your audience, if you demonstrate to the players in your game that you, you meant to do that, right? Like, if you, like, like with these primitive shapes, right? I think if I did this kind of poorly, I think it could read as developer art. Right, and then people won't take me seriously, and they won't play my game. But because I was consistent, and because I did a bunch of things to show that I, hey, I really meant to do this. Right, like if you look at like Dr. Seuss, um, is it an example I use all the time? Like that art isn't like technically good, um, but it's consistent, and so it feels intentional. And so then you come along for the ride, right? And all of a sudden, it's actually creative and whimsical and magical, right? Um, so all of that is to say. Uh, one way to get consistency and intentionality, or at least like the appearance of that, is through post-processing. Um, and so these are basically like full screen effects that you add to like the whole screen. Uh, my favorite one, all of you stop what you're doing, go to your project right now and add vignette. Um, don't overdo it. And you don't actually need post-processing to do this. You can just, um, you can just uh, like, make a vignette in Photoshop. And let me see if I can show it to you really quick. Um, so this is, whoops, this is my next project, a little sneak peek, uh, but just to show you what vignette is. So see kind of the gradient around the screen? Uh, that is vignette. And you, there is a post-processing processing way to do it. I like to do it kind of manually now. But you see just that like darkening around the the edges. I I know it maybe doesn't seem like much, but like vignette is like the number one thing because it, to me it's like you're putting a frame on your painting. Uh, it's another metaphor I like to use all the time. But it just it just gives it that little bit of like intentionality, that little bit of like polished finished quality. It makes everything look better. Just put vignette on all of your work. Just just go do it. Um, uh, and then another one is color correction. Uh, so this is another one I use all the time. So post-processing. Um, oh, I guess I'm not using it here. Color grading is another word for it. Uh, but basically it lets you kind of like sh shift the colors of different color ranges. Uh, and if you don't know where to start, uh, these are all sort of fancy names. This is basically uh, make your dark colors a particular color right um your mid tones a particular color and your brights a particular color and so 
if you think about the way the light works, um, shadows are a little bit cooler, right? Because the light, the sunlight is a little bit warmer, right? It's a little bit kind of orangey yellow. So what I do is I just, I, I make my whites a little bit, you know, kind of orange, warm, uh, if you will. And then my dark's a little bit cooler. Uh, and it just, all of this is like, it kind of doesn't matter what you do. The, the important part is that all of a sudden, anything I put into the game kind of looks like it belongs. Right? Uh, I guess I've turned that off for now. But um, yeah, uh, so that's, that's vignette and color correction, I think, are like two of my favorite tools uh, to get stuff to feel sort of intentional and uh, consistent. Uh, and then bloom and overlays. Uh, I, I probably overuse bloom, to be honest. Um, but it's all about trying to get stuff to feel like it belongs together. Um, uh, oh, Nick asks, am I using a library for color grading or is it built in? Uh, it's built into Unity. Uh, the, I'm using the built-in render pipeline and the universal render pipeline. Um, it's called something different. There, it's like broken up into a couple of different things. So it, it might be just called like, you know, look for like color grading or color correction or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and overlays, uh, I usually, um, I usually have some like subtle overlay texture again, just to kind of tie, tie the room together, so to speak. Um, yeah, so I know that was really fast. Again, I've given like a whole talk about this. Uh, I could talk about this all the time, but limited color palette, primitive shapes, uh, for everything that you can't get away with just like a circle, a square, or a triangle, go to the noun project, uh, code of an animation flat shading and silhouette, and then post-processing. And here's a bunch of examples of my games, right? So it's not, I don't feel especially limited. Um, so I feel like really good. You know, this is like, I don't know, five years of my work. Um, and I like the way this stuff looks. Like it's not perfect. And, and you know, I don't know that I'll ever win like an award for game art, but I don't, Feel, like I used to feel when I was a, a beginner, uh, you know, as like, oh, I can do the programming, I can do the game design, but my art just sucks, like, and it's getting in the way, no one will take me seriously. Um, now I kind of feel like people will play my games, right? Like, they'll, they'll, they'll at least give my games a shot, and, and if they're fun, then they'll keep playing them. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's art. Um, and again, yeah, like, almost all of these are, like, primitive shapes, limited color palette, post-processing, um, vignette on everything, uh, yeah. Okay, so audio, so I think, I don't know if this is gonna work, uh, apparently, um, if I share a specific screen, um, or if, no, if I share a specific application, uh, you will be able to hear the audio, and so I'm, I'm not really, so it's like, number one, I'm a programmer. Number two, I'm an artist. Distant third is like musician and sound designer. Um, and I struggled with audio for a long time. I finally feel like I have a solution to, uh, I can't tell Elliot if you're serious or if this is gonna be a disaster. Um, but, uh, so this is Ableton. Uh, I found, I sort of found a couple of tutorials that uh, are about sort of like generative music. Um, so first of all, everything you're about to hear is like a sine wave. Um, so just like the most basic audio. So you think of like a primitive shape in audio. Uh, and then, uh, so, well, I'm not gonna go too much into this. If you're like an audio person, you're really interested in this, just let me know. Uh, but all of this is just sort of procedural audio. So I'm just gonna start all this stuff. Can you guys hear that? Yes. So all of these MIDI clips, so MIDI is just like a computer audio, right? Um, are just, I'm just playing one note with different rhythms. Um, and then I, I do this thing called follow actions. Uh, so it will kind of shift, but then there are basically I'm basically randomizing the note, and then I'm sort of locking it to a scale, right? Um, 
and I kind of do that with, and then like all this stuff has like reverb and delay and stuff like that. But like, so this could play forever and I'll just get an infinitely long set of music. Um, and then what I do is I record it to, I basically just like hit record. And so like all of the randomized stuff gets recorded onto its own MIDI track. Right. And so that's what this is. This is just me hitting play and letting it play for however long. Uh, and then I go in and I start to chop up and I'm like, okay, I really like this section. I really like this section. And then I kind of put it together. Um, yeah, John, like, I, so I really feel like this is really beautiful. Like the, the music and I, I like, um, I really feel like I don't know what I'm doing, but I knew, I knew the, the important things that I knew, uh, were like, um, well, I, I saw these tutorials about how to make procedural music, right? Uh, and then I knew, oh, I should lock this to a scale, right? Uh, and Ableton lets you do that, right? And so all of these are sort of just locked to, a, a, in this case, a minor pentatonic scale. Um, and I also happen to know that the pentatonic scale, you can play, if you think about like wind chimes, uh, any note from the pentatonic scale will sound good with any other note. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I do that, uh, and then I put in some ambience. So this is for Betty and Earl, and this is for the winter section. Um, and so then I just have some ambience, right? So some like howling wind, which I got from like a library. Um, yeah, and so this is now my strategy for making music. And I made, uh, I think like seven different tracks for Betty and Earl. And then I've made one for my Tiny Mask Games game. This is Ableton, by the way. This is like paid software. Um, I think most of what I'm using you could get from like the cheapest version. Uh, I'm going to guess that most audio software has all of these capabilities in it. And, uh, oh yeah, so up here, Ableton Live is what it's called. Uh, but yeah, I really like it. Uh, I have like the full version. Um, yep, Ableton. Or Ableton. Ableton, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love Ableton. It's kind of... Okay, so when I was like 14, back in the days of Kazaa uh, and Napster, uh, I got myself a copy of Ableton on the on the sly and that's just the one that i like stuck with and now i'm a big kid and i pay for it and so it's i, I kind of just stick with it because it's the one i know uh it's maybe not the like the right one to use but i love it to death um but again i'm like i don't really know my way around it i had to follow tutorials to get this going but anyways okay uh probably spent too much time talking about audio uh no, not share. Every time I hit that button by mistake. Okay. Um, so, uh, so audio is so important. Um, even if you don't do any kind of music, uh, use find some ambience, find an ambient loop, and just put it in the background. Um, because one, it gives you that intentional feel that I was talking about. But two, I found that like if you have sound effects, which are like critical, like as important as your 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 visuals or sound effects. Um, but if you kind of just have sound effects on like a with no background at all, no background audio, it, it feels really wrong. Um, and the sound effects feel like they don't work together. But if you put just like some background noise, even if you, if you look up like room tone is, is a good one, but just ambience, right? Ambient noise. Um, then all of a sudden the sound effects feel less jarring to me for some reason. I don't know, maybe someone who knows better than I do could, could answer that, why that happens. But um, um, again, I use sine waves for the uh, for the music itself. That's again the primitive shapes of sound. Uh, lots of reverb and delay. That's just a stylistic thing. But I don't know. Maybe I, I kind of think of reverb and delay as like the bloom of of sound. Um, and then over the years, I've just acquired you know because I, I wasn't like a sound effect designer. I just would buy anytime there'd be a sale. I'd buy a library of sound effects, and now I've just got like. 10,000 sound effects, and I still can never find the one that I want, um, but I get close. Close enough. Um, Matt, is your, is your stream paused? Uh, oh. I, I don't yeah, see. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, right, because... Thank you, John. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, okay, good. No, yeah, it's because I was just showing Ableton, but then, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but anyway, so audio is so important. Procedural composition, sine waves, reverb and delay, uh, lots of libraries. And then I found it, and again, it's be probably because it's like my, my weakest skill. Um, it just takes me forever. And so in the future, I plan to hire someone. Uh, yeah, Chris, Chris, I'm working with this guy, Chris Bolt, um, who I don't guess him, he's not here. Um, but it's, uh, I plan to hire at least for some of the sound effect design. Uh, okay. So publishing, uh, so I, if you're going to make a small game, um, I love itch. I love itch to death. Um, it's like, I just, I just love it. Um, this is my itch page. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I, I, I make stuff for uni WebGL, uh, and I think that just gives me the best chance that people will play my game. Even I, like, I find there's a lot of friction, like, oh, I don't want, on itch, I don't want to download someone's .exe and run it on my computer. Feels a little bit sketchier. Um, and it's more clicks and stuff like that. And and WebGL is, is great, but you kind of have to build, a, you can't build something with really fantastic lighting or, or a lot of post-processing. Um, yeah. Uh, I found it's really helpful to have a press kit. So I make a press kit uh, for my games that helps streamers, uh, it sort of entices streamers to play the game. Uh, and then I relied a lot on the Tiny Mask Games community to boost engagement. Um, so uh, Ezra Santon, I don't know if Ezra's here, uh, one of the moderators for Time Mask Games discovered, and I don't know how, but that if you post, if you get someone to post a YouTube video in your comments, it like drastically increases your uh, page ranking or sort of like your, you know, where you are in the itch sort of like popular games feed. Uh, and so trying to get Tiny Mask Games people to kind of like, Play test, you know, post play test videos of our games that helps a ton. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, John asks, what's Pixel Nest? That's just this. Uh, so Rami, I think, made Do Press Kit, uh, which is like a PHP thing. Um, I didn't want to use PHP for my press kit. So there's this other library that lets you just kind of like run a local server uh i don't know if it's javascript or python or i forget what it is um but it just kind of lets you sort of like pre-render it uh i can't go into how i do my press kit so uh oh, i never remember if it's press is this the right one no press through um so yeah, so um, yeah. So here's this tool. So if you're like not a programmer, this stuff is going to seem kind of like uh, maybe scary or confusing. Like, don't worry about it. There's like easier tools to use than this. And yeah, John, this is exactly the same thing as the Rami press kit, which is uh, the press kit. Is that... Yeah, so this is like the original, you see, this is like the industry standard for a press kit. Um, so, so I can't see your full screen name because I've got streamer uh, mode enabled, but M asks, what is a press kit? Uh, and it's basically just like a really digestible way to learn about your game and your company. Um, so that if uh, someone is writing an article about you or streaming uh, for your game, it's sort of like a really easy way to do that, right? Like just sort of like quick facts. Uh, you can see the stuff I've worked on. It's like a really condensed little portfolio with um, uh, with stuff, you know, like assets and things like that. It's got game logos, uh, right? It's kind of just got like the facts. Um, and I'll show you the for for this game. Right, so it's got logos, stuff like that. Stuff that just, if someone wants to write an article about this game, I make it as easy as possible for them, right? Because I want them to write an article. I want them to stream my game. Um, yeah, and actually the reason that I do this is in my first Tiny Mask Game game, Wanderbots was like, hey, could you, could, do you have like a logo for your game? And I was like, holy shit. Um, 
yeah, yeah, I do. And then so then I got really good about doing it because he was gracious enough to actually like ask me. Uh, there might be other big name streamers out there who just don't care and they're like, you know what, too much work, not gonna bother. Um, yeah. Um, so, anyways, I use this tool. Very easier tools to help you sort of like assemble a press kit. Uh, you don't really have to do it yourself. This is like the original one. There's probably all kinds of tutorials about how to set this up. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for publishing. Uh, okay, uh, so what worked? Um, so I would say building off the first game, which uh, maybe I'll show real quick. Um, uh, no. uh, I'll be real quick with this. Um, but I want to show you kind of one specific thing. So first of all, uh, the title screen is very similar. Um, like a lot of this stuff, right? Like it's little stuff that doesn't really take that much time, but uh, it kind of adds up. And so for my next game, right? For my second one, the title screen is basically done for me. I just had to do like a little design work. Um, uh, I see maybe this loading screen looks familiar. Uh, it's basically the same loading screen. Um, but the reason that here's a, a little secret for the the pro so. so it's sort of a vampire survivors like uh but the idea is like you are powering this tower and the tower is going to kill the things for you so rather than you doing the damage it's like your tower does uh and so i'm just going to get one level up to show you a thing uh, okay, so so maybe this looks familiar. This is the, the exact same sort of like roguelike screen that you saw in the in your own hand. Uh, and again, similar concept, right? Uh, and so I'll show you blobs. Um, right, similar concept of like you're you're also picking the enemies, right? So you're picking your power ups, but you're also picking the enemies. Um, and you'll also notice this eyeball here. Um, okay. Uh, and so I just got to level up. Um, so we'll do sprinkler. Right, and so you remember early on, or in the other game, I showed you the spore. Well, I was like, hey, you know, I was trying to think about like enemies that I could add. And, and I, I just looked to this game and it was like, oh yeah, I'll make a thing like the, the blob, right? Um, yeah, so so anyways, uh point there is um I was building off of the first game and I wasn't just like reusing assets, I was also reusing concepts, right? Like the eyeball and then the idea of I, I do a lot of things with uh biblically accurate angels, uh off often or whatever this the circle of eyeballs, uh if you've ever seen that. I do a lot of, of like that stuff. Right, so I, I reuse assets, but I also reuse concepts, uh, and it helps me creatively. Like, oh boy, I need another enemy. What should I do? And it's like, instead of like having to think about it, I just go back to like my old game, and I just pull one of those and kind of recast them. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so other stuff that really helps, and this is all tiny mass games. Like this, tiny, having the tiny mass games community is like so valuable uh, for playtesting. Uh, for brainstorming, like in our weekly meetings, this comes up all the time. I've gotten so much good feedback. Um, peer pressure. Uh, so just having like a weekly check-in is like, oh, I really want to get something done to show people what I worked on, right? Um, and just like, I, you know, partially because I was a founder, but also because I kind of, you know, I went to all the meetings and I showed my progress. It kind of felt like oh boy if i don't release a thing like oh i've, I've kind of let people down which i'm sure no one would have cared if i didn't release a game but like it, it helped motivate me a little bit um yeah the meetings were really helpful and then i talked about the marketing and pr um yeah uh and then so the design for this game i think the smart things that i did there's a lot of problems which i'll talk about 
but the smart things I did was it was intentionally cryptic. So I didn't have, you know, I kind of could lean into the fact that like, I wasn't going to do a lot of tutorial. Um, I could kind of not spend a lot of time on text. Uh, I didn't have to explain things. I didn't have to come up with really clever UI things or stuff like that. I just kind of, you know, this game is meant to be cryptic. Like you're supposed to struggle. Um, so that was actually, I think, kind of smart. Uh, and then I, I tracked the player's score. And I, I usually think of score as being kind of a lame thing that, like, games only do when they're weak. But actually, I like, after this game, I'm like, oh, actually, people really care about score um, if you do it right. Um, and so, like, I had a game and in, in your own hand, the card game there's an ending to it which is actually a challenge uh endings are really hard and they kind of discourage replayability right like once you beat the game like why would you keep playing well actually having a little score system uh in this case like how many cards did you play to get to to, to beat it like totally um let's see i should have kept this up um really drove uh the community like there's a whole thread about uh can i find it um oh yeah so like uh about like people succeeding and then someone and this is like crazy like you'll see like 410 cards that's probably what it takes to like to beat the game um but then like someone like super optimized uh, and got it down to like really, really low and found all these like crazy strategies, right, to, to get it. And so all these people are like posting their high score, posting their videos of how they got the high score. So that was, I'm really glad that I did this, um, you know, because I had a game with an ending. So like, why are people going to play it? Turns out people will play for score. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was like meaningful score. I think that's kind of like the important thing is tied like one to one to a gameplay mechanic. It wasn't like a thousand points for, for whatever. It was like really meaningful. Um, okay, so some challenges, uh, design challenges. So I think I picked a genre that was like really hard to execute on. Strategy games, I think take a long time to be fun and interesting. So my first game, uh, The Only Tower, it was like after one day, that game was fun. Uh, arcade games, action games, they're fun, like, really, really fast. Uh, not always, but, like, they, you know, they tend to be fun a lot sooner than a strategy game, where it's, it feels like it's not fun until a lot of the parts kind of start to come together and you get, like, emergent gameplay and stuff. So that was really challenging. Another challenge was uh, I had a win condition. So, like I said, you know, it one, it discourages replayability, but endings are just hard. They're just like really hard. You gotta have like a boss or you have to have a satisfying ending. Monty Python is sort of famous for they didn't they just found it was really hard to write endings for their sketches. And so they just didn't. And if you watch their shows, it's like so clear. Like they just never end a skit. It's like the skit's going on and it just cuts to a different skit. And that's like a big part of their thing. And it saved them probably lots of time and headache. It's so hard to come up with endings. Um so just don't. Just have like sort of an arcade style thing um yeah uh uh card art you know was kind of time consuming uh and then the card audio like every almost every card has like a unique sound effect so that was really time consuming um versus my other game where like every enemy death sounds the same right uh, yeah uh and then time so my timing was a little bit tough um so i didn't have a core loop partially because it was a strategy game, but I didn't have, like, you couldn't beat the game until, like, the end of the first month. Uh, and then three months is, like, uh, you know, it's just always a challenge. It's so hard. Uh, and then I had contract work. Uh, Betty Merrill was going to launch soon, so I had to give a lot of attention to that, and I have a one-year-old at home, so all challenging things. Um, yeah, and so what's next for me? Uh, so there's some things I want to do Tiny Mask Games to, to help improve it. Uh, I want to get like a press release template going so that like we can all announce our games and kind of, you know, power numbers and get someone hopefully excited enough to write an article about us. Uh, and if we could send out a press release every season, I feel like we'd, we'd probably start to get on people's radar. Uh, I want to make like a sizzle reel. So like just, you know, we've got 12 games now. We'll have, you know, a handful more at the end of this 
uh, season. Um, and so I think we could really make a really compelling sizzle reel, uh, you know, trailer type thing. Uh, and then something that we're going to try this season is we're going to do a coordinated release. So in the past, we kind of just like upload our games whenever. This time we're going to release on September 21st. Uh, and we're all going to kind of like push each other's games really hard, all sort of like a concerted effort. I think that'll be really great. Uh, and then this is my next project. Uh, it's, so this was originally supposed to be a Tiny Mask game game. I think I'm, I'm like actually so excited about it that I'm going to try and turn it into something bigger. I'm trying to get like funding and approach publishers and make a pitch deck and all that. Um, so this probably won't end up being a Tiny Mask game, but this is a sneak peek of what I'm working on. It is, a, again, a deck builder, uh, right? So I'm building off my previous thing. Uh, it's got all the stuff I talked about, right? Silhouettes. Um, post processing, um, limited color palette. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's what's next. Um, buy and wish list our stuff. Uh, so we talked about, uh, so I'm going to go do a little tour. So, we, uh, John mentioned Million Monster Militia. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a great game. This is, uh, I don't know, John could talk about it, but, uh, it's, uh, kind of like Luck Be a Landlord, if you remember that game, but it's it's awesome. It releases on the 17th, which is two days from now. You should all buy it, wishlist it, help them, support them. Boston people, great Boston people. Yeah, it's a great game. Uh, then we have my game, which released last week, or almost two weeks ago now, uh, Betty and Earl. Um, uh, it's like a little sliding block puzzle game where everything's connected and everything moves at the same time. And it's got some floofy, wooey, spiritual, weird existential undertones that probably no one will pick up on. Uh, but I'm proud of it. Um, yeah, if you're into puzzle games, check it out. Or even if you're not, check it out. Um, and then finally, uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, I'm only showing these games here because these are games that like released on Steam. Yeah, uh, Betty and Earl is good until it gets too hard, which is around winter, by the way. If you're playing and you get to winter, just persevere. You don't need to beat all the levels. You don't need to get the optional hearts. Just persevere. It gets easier after that. And all the good stuff is at the end. That's sort of on me. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Put your good stuff all throughout the game. Anyways, uh, our third... Oh, and Betty and Earl was not a Tiny Mask game game, so I'm a little bit cheating by bringing that up here. Sorry. Um, but... Um... The thing of the city. Uh, yeah, this is Josh Galecki's game. Fun little majesty like, if you know what that is. Yeah, um, but that also released. Uh, yeah, and then there's just a whole bunch of other tiny mass games. Com. Look at all these games. Uh, they're great. Like there, there's a lot of good stuff here. And this is just six months. We've two seasons. Uh, we're gonna have a whole bunch soon. A whole bunch more soon. Okay, uh, I think that's it. I know I went fast. I talked too fast uh, during these things. Uh, but thank you for listening. Uh, blah blah is so good. Uh, this is me, Giant Light Studios. Contact me here. Time last games on the right. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, any questions, thoughts? Yeah, I think there's a few questions in the speaker questions forum. If, uh, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Go back. From... Okay. Uh, I think they're just. Jake, I think Jake. Had a couple of questions. Mm. Okay. If, if anyone has questions, post them there. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer Jake's and then okay. yeah, post questions in here as I so. Sure. Um, so Jake asks, how do you balance your solo development with work you do on a team? Um, so I am very fortunate. I do contract work pretty full time, uh, and I can survive on about four days a week of contract work. Um, and usually what I do is I have one day a week where I work on time mass game stuff. And then four days a week, I work on other stuff. And then like kind of nights and weekends, I, I, I do my other, you know, time mass game stuff. Um, it's tough though. It's hard. Uh, not everyone can do what I'm doing. Um, yeah, but that's kind of how I balance it. Um, do you have a standalone version of your own hand or is it just web-based? Uh, so I just have the web-based version. I should have a, a standalone version that was important for my first game. Uh, I, I'm guessing streamers would prefer a standalone version. 
Um, so I should do that. I just, I guess I didn't. Um, have you used any skeletal animation to speed up the animation process? I have used that stuff in the past. I still think that that is super time consuming. Um, I do, you'll see in a lot of my games, there's almost no animation. It's just a little bit there to kind of make stuff feel alive. Um, so even skeletal animation feels way too time consuming, but I'm just not an animator, right? Um, okay, so Nick asks, can you talk about the pace and motivation? Does a Tiny Mask game feel like a sprint to you, like 40 to 60 hours a week, or is it more relaxed? Um, it comes and goes. I think part of being a contractor is like, it's very spiky. Like sometimes I'm very busy. Like it's like, oh my God, I'm working an eight hour week. Other times it's like, I'm doing whatever I want. I'm playing other games for inspiration. I'm, you know, working out during the day. Um, so it's very spiky. Um, it, sometimes it feels like a sprint. Sometimes it feels relaxed. Um, motivation. I just like making games, I guess. And I want to be successful. Um, I don't want to have to do anything else. And I would love to only work on my own stuff. That's definitely my big motivation. Um, yeah, and did you just say one day a week on Tiny Mask Games? Yes. Um, although I would say it's kind of like uh, for the second game, this card game, my first month was actually less than that uh, because I was finishing a big contract. And then my second month was a little bit more than that. Um, so yeah, one day a week. So yeah, so like I'm doing this really fast, like getting really fast and like I'm cutting every corner that I can while still trying to like make something good. So like when I said make something small, like really mean it. <laughs> um, and not everyone does one day a week. Um, I think John did more than that for Million Monster Militia. Um, yeah, I yeah, did. <laughs> yeah. But other people do more, other people do less. Um, you can do it. You, I'm proof that you can do this. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, people can just chime in too if you don't, you don't have to write anything. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Sure. So, first off, like, um, uh, I do work as a, a full time job at a grocery store, um, where I work behind a deli counter. So anyway, um, what advice do you have for like um solo game devs that um that, like uh work on games when they're dealing with like a full time job? Yeah. Uh, that's like a uh, forty to fifty hours per week, and how yeah. do you like uh manage the time for it? Yeah, uh, it's a big challenge. Um, uh, what I would say, um, and it's different, right? Like I got, I started games a while ago, but I, I graduated college and I was a baker at Brewers for like a year and a half. Um, and what I, I guess, and this is the advice that I would give myself back then. I don't know if it's still, I think it's still reasonable, uh, but it's like do game jams. Um, like try to find time to just like set aside a weekend and see what you can make in a weekend and they're grueling they're tough they suck they're great like they're a lot of fun um but getting games that you've like completed and kind of forcing yourself to complete a thing right it's not enough to just sort of like prototype the beginning of a thing but, like finish it finish it finish it finish it and it doesn't need to be polished it won't be polished but just getting that stuff done, I think, goes a long way towards having something in a portfolio that you can show a job. And then maybe you can get a job sort of tangentially related to games. So, like, I did web development for, for a couple of years. That's not games, but, I, like, it was programming. And then I could kind of, like, apply some of those skills. And then I got a job doing educational games where, like, half my job was doing web development. So do game jams and then f try and find a job that's sort of like tangential to or like kind of adjacent to the thing you want to do in games. So if you want to be an artist, maybe do try to like get a graphic de design job or something like that. Um, but it's tough. It's, it's so hard. Please, you know, it's very easy to get discouraged. It's really hard to get your foot in the door with games. Um, coming to these meetups is huge. Like I wish I had done way more of that. Um, it's really hard. It's discouraging. It's hard. 
once you get that first job though it is like a billion times easier to get the second job so like stick with it get that first job and and then a lot of things open up yeah all right thanks you're welcome good luck thanks any other questions um quickie I actually run a um, video game review uh, website of my own. It hasn't been active for a while, but I'm thinking about restarting it. Would you be interested in an interview or something like that since you offer press kits? Uh, reviews uh, and interviews. Uh, I'm open to that kind of thing. Uh, I've done that before. I'm, do I'm doing a, a thing like that right now. I'm happy to share... Um, Keys with people too for the community. If you want to like post a review, you know you don't have to buy the game. Um, I'm like crazy yeah. busy right now, uh, but yeah, if you message me, we could probably find a time in the future. Yeah, if I could just get your email, I could just send you the link and get your press kit. I'm already looking at your uh, itch.io site. Did, yep. did you drop your uh, information? Your website? Yeah, here. Uh, drop that somewhere. And, yeah. Uh, Okay, um, what channel is that? Is so, that oh. yeah, that's in here. So, it's my email, uh, and then John. All right. Um, is that higher up, or are you sending it out now? Yeah, no, it should be in the general chat. In the in oh, the general. voice chat, there's a... Oh, in the voice, yeah, in the voice chat, like the next oh, the general. Voice? Yeah, so uh, there's, so if you look, there's like a speech bubble next to general. Yeah. Oh, duh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My bad. It's also up on All the right. screen. Yeah, I see it. I got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question with regards to uh, uh, TMG seasons. Are, are you guys looking for people to come in and out for various seasons, or is it just a you're looking for long-time commitment? I'd love to know more about what, what you're looking for to get getting into it. Uh, we are not looking for anything. If you want to join, you can join. Um, it's totally up to you. It's all very self-directed. Uh, we're not really looking for anything. People come in, they make a game. They don't make a game the next season. Some people have made two games right now. Um, it's totally up to you. Just let me know. I'll get you a, a Discord invite. Um, and actually, why don't I just do that? Um, so, okay. Oh, Discord, you're in that way. So this uh, link won't la will only last a week, um, and I ask you not to share it outside of here. Um, let's see, where did you go? Um, so, oh, thanks, Matt. Yeah. Uh, another question: Do you know of anybody who is primarily a non-programmer at Tiny Mask Games, and anything about their struggles, successes in the group? Um, I do think it's more of a struggle if you're not a programmer. Um, one of our moderators, Alex Crowley, I don't know if Alex is here. Um, I think he's had some, you know, struggled a little bit. Um, we do at the kind of the week or two before a season begins, we do a team finding sort of meeting, kind of like a pitch night where everyone throws out their ideas and try to form teams. So that's one way uh, non-programmers can like find themselves on a team uh, but there are also like some great tools like Twine and Bitsy. Like if you if you're okay, kind of not making a totally traditional game, you can. There are tools that help with that. Um, yeah, so it, it is a little bit more of a challenge. But yeah, and and actually, like I think there's a, we would love to have more artists and more musicians because a lot of us are programmers. So there's definitely like both of us want each other and we're not finding each other. So like, we'd love to have you um, and show up to that like pitch night. Yeah, um, Kevin's on a team of two programmers and